The Gentle Art of Making Happy by George H. Morrison Chapter 1 On the Gentle Art of Making Happy I was reading the other day an essay by a supremely able critic on John Milton. Milton's first wife, as most readers know, was the last woman in the world he should have chosen. He was a Puritan, trained in a Puritan household, and she was a young, shy, royalist girl. Now, I suppose there have been many curious honeymoons, but I question if there was ever one so strangely employed as Milton's was. He employed it in writing a tract on divorce. His young wife left him, ran away home again, but we have no hint that Milton's heart was broken. He seems to have been passionately angry and out of his passion to have reared his arguments on the doctrine and the discipline of divorce. It was not the first time, and it was not the last, that a man has spun his arguments to suit his heart. But the theme I wish to speak on is different, and it was suggested by a remark of the critic I spoke of. Looking back on the story of that young royalist wife, shy, frightened, feeling the gulf between her and her husband, looking back on that, Professor Dowden says, quote, The art of creating happiness, the most beautiful and most difficult of the fine arts, Milton had not studied. His genius was not fired by the ambition of evoking smiles from sadness. End quote. The art of creating happiness, then, says the professor. Now remember that happiness is one thing and joy, which we often confuse with it, another. We are so apt to take these words that differ like fancy and imagination, merriment and gladness, and use them indiscriminately in our talk. But joy is a serious, sober, inward thing. I question if any but God can create joy. It springs from the depths of this mysterious soul which only the true finger of deity can touch. True joy is often far too deep for laughter, but often it is not too deep for tears. But happiness is that which happens to us. It haps on us, lights on us from without. Joy rises in the soul like a spring of water. Happiness comes like a swallow to the eaves. Joy grows from a hidden seed planted within. Happiness meets us like music, like a friend. Hence, to create joy is the great science of God. But to foster happiness may be the art of man. And this is what the professor says of it, quote, It is the most beautiful and the most difficult of the fine arts, end quote. After all, if the greatness of an art somewhat depends on the kind of material the artist works in, there may be no exaggeration in his words. For sound is mysterious and color is wonderful, but the human heart is more wonderful than both, and it is the material of the heart I work in whenever I try to make another happy. Of course, in this gentle art of giving happiness, we are fellow workers with God. The longer we live, the more convinced we are that God is at infinite pains to make us happy. In the stern religion of our noble forefathers, that perhaps was the one point of failure. They secretly thought, although they might not dare to put it into words, that God was displeased when men were very happy. Hence, Scotland has had many gloomy saints and has had magnificent instances of rugged piety. But Scotland has not been rich in happy Christians. Indeed, to a true Scotsman, the very term happy Christian has always had a kind of shallow ring. I do not quarrel with that feeling at all. It is not a man's chief duty to be happy, but... To try to make 
others happy is a duty, and I say that God is at infinite pains in that. We all know that when we reach the glory, we shall be utterly ashamed we were not better here. I sometimes think that when we reach the glory, we shall be equally ashamed we were not happier here. We were intended to be far happier than we are. Nine-tenths of the unhappiness of life is an insult cast in the teeth of God. A saint, after all, is just a childlike soul who lets God make him happy constantly. Now in the divine exercise of this fine art, this strikes me, that it is not by rare things, but by common and simple things that our Father in heaven makes his children happy. Can you tell me some of the rarer gifts of God? Well, genius is one, high talent is another, and the power of embodying thought in poetry and exquisite beauty. These are God's rarer gifts. But I have never heard that the possession of these gifts carried the certainty of happiness along with them. Nay, on the contrary, genius is notoriously unhappy. The exquisite sensitiveness of the poetic nature is jarred where you and I should feel no misery. And the tragedies of the beautiful women of the world are perhaps the saddest stories of all history. Rare gifts are needed. The world could not live without them. But it is not rare gifts that make men happy. It is the common and simple and universal gifts. It is health and the glance of sunshine in the morning. It is fresh air. It is the friend, the lover. It is the kindliness that meets us on the journey. It may only be a word, a smile, a look. It is these common and everyday and simple things, all coming to us from God, according to my gospel. It is these and not any rarity of blessing that are God's gentle art of making happy. I was walking the other evening in the country, a gray, keen, beautiful gloaming, while the bell from the old priory was tolling, coming clear and sharp cut through the frosty air. And everything was very still, and everything was very full of God, when suddenly, out of the shadows of one of the long fields, a strong masculine voice came ringing towards me, singing one of the finest of our old Scotch songs, and singing it out with all his heart in it, only a plowman with his week's work done. And in an instant, the words of Emerson came back to me, and I had not read the essay for ten years. Quote, how doth nature defy us with its cheap elements, says Emerson. Give me health and a day, and I will make the pomp of emperors ridiculous, end quote. And I thought of the rich and the titled and the learned in London who had almost everything except a singing heart. And I thought how strange it was that in that steaming field there should have been more happiness than in a score of palaces. He had got health and a day, you understand, and was making the pomp of emperors ridiculous. Got it from nature, Emerson would say. Say rather, got it from nature's God. It was an object lesson from the country of God's gentle art of making happy. Now, if you are to practice that great art, will you remember that secret of the heavens? We are so apt to despise our common opportunities and wait till the day of great things reaches us. But it isn't by great things that you make others happy. It is not by extraordinary kindnesses and sacrifices. It is by the common, by the simple, by the universal, by what is in your power from week to week. We could have spared all Milton's tracks on divorce if he had only tried, like a Christian and a gentleman, to make that lonely royalist wife of his a happy bride. The world could want Carlyle's Frederick the Great, but it was infinitely sad and pitiable that Mrs. Carlyle should have wanted little kindnesses. 
and none knew it better than the old prophet himself when he stood beside his wife's grave in Haddington. That was a wise remark of Michael Angelo's when a friend accused him of having been idle. Nay, nay, said Michael Angelo, not idle. See, I have softened this feature and brought out that muscle. Bah, said his friend, all these are trifles. Yes, said the sculptor, but trifles make perfection, and perfection is no trifle. How doth nature defy us with a few cheap elements? Live you according to nature, and do the same. Trifles make happiness. Minute denials, infinitesimal sacrifices, touches of the old tenderness of the sweet May time, the resolute cherishing of little courtesies. Trifles make happiness, and however it may seem when all is well, the neglected happiness of those who loved you will seem no trifle at the deathbed and the grave. I think, too, that the greatest condemnation of our little sins is just that they mar life's happiness so much. I think that the tragedy of very many homes is not the bereavement, not the storm or whirlwind. It is that they should be so near, so very near to happiness, yet somehow, by a hairbreadth, should just miss it. You may destroy the loot by breaking it in twain, and there are homes and there are friendships wrecked that way. But the little rift within the lute, the poet tells us, makes all the music mute, and a thousand homes would be happy but for that. It seems a small thing when an upright and good man has a quick and irritable temper. We make large excuses for him. We do not judge him harshly. It makes him more human, and perhaps we smile at it. But remember that when we were children, we used to smile at the drunkard. We never troubled about the drunkard's home. There are some sins that are transgressions against God. There are some sins that are transgressions against love. But there are other sins that are sins against the happiness of others, and you ought to add that standard to your measurement. Only a rift, but where is all the music? Only a fly, but what of all the ointment? In the name of all we love and all who love us, may God forgive us for our little sins. There are some people who seem to radiate happiness, It is easier to be happy when we are with them. They come like sunshine into any company and eyes are brighter just because they are there. They seem to have been born and fashioned just for this, to make their little world a little happier. Frank Bullen, in his inimitable tale of the South Seas, The Cruise of the Cachalot, speaks of that curious substance known as ambugris. It is found floating when a whale has been killed, and its one use is to heighten the odor of scent. It is employed in commerce for that only. Yet this strange substance, ambergris they call it, that gives a body and a fragrance to a hundred essences, is absolutely odorless itself. And I think that all of us have known some lives quite commonplace, fragrant with no gifts, yet every life they touched or entered seemed to be brighter and happier and richer for them. It may be some are born artists in happiness, as others have been born artists in color. But you and I have not been born that way, and so I say this to you and to myself, and with all my heart I believe that it is true. The one great secret in this gentle art is to live in daily fellowship with Christ. It is then that being freed from tyrannous worry, we have a heart at leisure from itself. It is then we feel that to be clever is little and that it is only noble to be good. It is then above all that the spirit of sacrifice begins to work through the commonest day Then we may never write a paradise lost, but our happy homes shall be paradise regained, 
and we shall beat even John Milton in what the wise professor wisely calls the most beautiful and most difficult of the fine arts, the art of creating happiness. The Gentle Art of Making Happy by George H. Morrison Chapter 2 On the Deep Significance of the Usual Luke 16, verse 30 and 31 If they hear not Moses and the prophets There is no difficulty in grasping the thought that was working in the mind of Jesus It is the thought that when usual methods fail, unusual methods are not likely to succeed. The rich man in torment is pictured as praying to Abraham that a messenger might be sent from the dead to his five brothers. He has not forgotten the feelings of a brother even in the burning of his agony. And so he pleads that one be sent from the dead to them, if so be they might be spared this hell. But Abraham answered, It would be useless ministry. If they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rose from the dead. And Jesus means that where the usual failed, where men have ceased to feel the deep significance of present and common and customary ministries, no startling of any ghostly voice nor any alarm of special apparition is likely to change the character permanently. Here then, our blessed lords put the accent of his teaching on the usual. And I think that a little study of the life of Jesus will reveal that he was in the habit of doing that. In the next chapter, we have a case in point. It was when the Pharisees asked when the kingdom of God should come, and they thought it was coming with the noise of trumpet, with the sound of marching, perhaps with the din of thunder. They thought it was coming arrestingly and strikingly, and they could not help but see it when it came. And Jesus answered, The kingdom of God cometh not with observation, neither shall they say, Lo here, lo here, for behold, The kingdom of God is among you. It was Jesus discounting, so to speak, the marvelous and laying the stress upon the usual. Or again, we might recall the wealth of meaning that Jesus loved to find in usual things. In the story of his teaching, we do not read of the eclipse or of the meteor. We do read of pieces of silver and of sheep. We see the kingdom of heaven in a mustard seed. There was an exquisite little sermon in the sparrow. The lilies of the field, no one had eyes for them, till Jesus made them the preachers of God's providence. And the children, whom most philosophers are too deep to notice, proved deeper than all of the philosophers to Jesus. Christ saw, Christ felt the meaning of the usual. The ordinary was extraordinary to Jesus. And I cannot help feeling that life would mean more to us and that we should live it in a more Christ-like way if we cultivated that attitude of mind. For there can be no question that it is one of our commonest errors to give an undue place to the unusual. We are all eyes for the wonders of the cataract but we neglect the long, quiet reaches of the river. In everything uncommon, there lies a power of arrest. It appeals to our fears. It helps to break monotony. Perhaps it touches us with the sweet sense of mystery. Until the appeal of it turns into a craving and the true proportions of noble life are lost. I do not think that any man can live well who has lost the Christ sense of what the usual means. I do not think that any life is strong that finds no message and no music in the ordinary. It matters little if miracles have ceased, if the whole universe is a miracle to me. Heaven, hell, death, love, and all the mysteries, find them within a stone's throw of your door.
In the old world, this too familiar error of laying the chief stress on the unusual was seen at its height in the art of divination. It is indeed very difficult for us to realize the important part that the diviner played in paganism. He was consulted before every campaign. He was to indicate the best hour for battle. No step was taken. No great change was made without the diviner telling if all looked propitious. And the whole science and skill of the diviner lay in interpreting signs that were extraordinary. The flight of birds the way they ate their corn, the quivering of the leaves upon the tree, the chatterings and ravings of the maniac. It was such things that stopped the Roman legions. It was such things that cheered them on to battle. It was in the strange. It was in the accidental. It was in the extraordinary, however trifling, that the old pagan found the will of God. No wonder that human life became distorted. No wonder that simple and elemental things on which the strength and sanctities of life rest grew common and unclean in pagan Rome. Rome really perished of the fatal error of never seeing the meaning of the usual. And I think that in our modern world, though the diviner is long discredited, I think that that is one great danger of the newspaper— It lays such an exaggerated stress upon everything startling that the worth and meaning of the usual is forgotten. Let some young fool who has millions to his credit gamble away a fortune in an hour and every newspaper in Britain will report it. But thousands of citizens are spending well and wisely in helpful charity in educating their children, and we do not read in the newspaper of that. If any drunken husband beat his wife last night, we shall read all about it in the papers tomorrow. But thousands of homes were very happy yesterday. The children were romping and the wives went singing, yet somehow we shall hear nothing of all that. And it is the failure to remember that that makes the pessimist. The pessimist is the prophet of the unusual. The Christian shuts his eyes to none of it. It has its place, its dark place in the world, but he has learned from Christ something of life's proportion. He knows that the usual is filled with God, though it pays no man to record it daily. He does not expect to find life's bests among the hoardings, for the kingdom cometh not with observation. Again, I think we all need to observe the deep significance of the usual in revealing character. It is not the rare event, the unexpected crisis, that is the surest touchstone of a life. It is the management of ordinary days. It is the fulfillment of the usual tasks Someone has said that we should avoid judging anybody by a single action, but if ever we are compelled to do it, let the action be quite an ordinary one. It is likelier that the character will be revealed in that than in some rare moment of intensity. The great hours declare what we may yet be or what we might have been, but... The common and unregarded hours show what we are. Is he a Christian? One asked once of another. How do I know, was the reply. I never saw him at home. He had seen him praying, preaching, handing the bread and wine. But he had never seen him with his wife and children. That means that to estimate a character, you should regard the even tenor of a life. It means that you are a stranger to yourself if you forget everything except a few choice deeds. It is dangerous to take the verdict of uncommon actions. If you want the truth, judge yourself by today. I suppose that is the reason why all our great novelists bring in the startling with such a sparing hand. You cannot read our master novelist, but you feel the supreme importance of the usual. The weaker sort must drag in crime and murder. 
There is hardly a chapter without violence or alarm. I take it that there are multitudes who think a novel a failure unless it is violent, sensational, and scarlet. But the consummate masters never degrade things so. How leisurely they are, how quiet and easy. How they will take some common day or incident and work it out into a chapter. Until through a score of chapters such as that, somehow the characters begin to breathe. We love them. They become our intimates. If we meet them tomorrow, we should recognize them. And all the violence of all the scribblers can never win a victory like that. Then what did Paul mean when he wrote, If I have not charity, it profiteth me nothing, though I speak with the tongues of men and angels, and though I give my body to be burned, and though I could remove mountains by my faith, and have not charity, I am nothing. He meant that you may have the most uncommon gifts and may rise in some splendid moment to the most uncommon deeds. But if you lack the common grace of love, let your religion be written down a cipher. In other words, the test of Christian character is not the exceptional and the extraordinary. I may understand all mysteries and be a castaway, but the case is different when I understand all love. The test is a common grace, a universal instinct, a worldwide passion redeemed and made sublime. I cannot read that matchless chapter of Corinthians, but I feel the value and the power of the ordinary. And there is one thing more that science has taught us. One radical change she has wrought in our conceptions, and I believe that in this respect at any rate, science is working in full harmony with Jesus. Science has taught us that in the world of nature, it is the usual that most truly reveals God. Had you asked a Jew where he found God in nature, he would have said, in the storm and in the thunderbolt. It was the voice of the Lord that broke the cedars of Lebanon. It was the voice of the Lord that rolled through the lightning fire. And away in the heart of Africa tonight, a meteor or a comet would drive a tribe half mad. But they have never dreamed of finding the divine in the coming of summer or the springing of flowers. Now, it may be that having lost that feeling, that the sense of the immediate touch of the Creator... The presence of God is not so keenly felt in the whistling wind or amid the clash of elements. But if God is not in the whirlwind or in the fire, it is an infinite gain that by the toil of science we have wakened at last to hear the still, small voice. We find him now in the great laws of nature. We find him in nature's uniformity. We find him in that great force that binds the stars, yet keeps the tiniest atom in its place. In every springtime, with its cloak of green, in every flower that buds, in every bird that sings, in every day that breaks and night that falls, we trace the action of divine intelligence. The sun in its course teaches us more of God than it taught the Jew when it stood still at Agilon. Once, men saw God in the unusual in nature. It is in the usual that we see God now. And so we come back to where we started from, the prayer to send a messenger from the dead. Let no one wait for that unusual messenger. The usual is the significant, the divine. Attend to the usual appeals of God. There may never come the unusual call you wait for. The dream of a great chance is ruination. Live at your highest in your usual duty. The common messages will become rich that way. The common tasks will become kingly. It will be better and easier every year to live, and it will be far easier to die. The Gentle Art of Making Happy by George H. Morrison Chapter 3 On the Sweet Doctrine of the Second Mile Matthew 5, verse 41 
Whosoever shall compel thee to go a mile, go with him twain. It has been said that the best of all teachers is he who can turn an ear into an eye. That is, the man who enables us to see a thing, who helps us to picture it in our imagination, impresses the truth on us as no other can. Now that was singularly true of Jesus. He turned the ear into the eye continually. He seldom argued, seldom discussed a point. He did not lead men forward by the steps of logic. He saw, and like a poet, made men see. He lit up the eternal things as with a flashlight, and doubtless that is one, one out of many reasons, why after the revolution of the centuries we are turning to the teaching of Jesus still. Here, then, is one of the little pictures that Jesus hung in the inspired picture gallery. Whosoever shall compel thee to go a mile, go with him, twain. There was not a woman in the crowd but understood, perhaps tried to carry it out as she went homeward. A simple rule for a very simple duty. They could obey that, at least, if nothing else. And only gradually it would dawn on them that there was a wealth of meaning in the picture, that there was a principle behind the rule, that there was a truth to be endlessly expanded. And they would begin then to be aware that this Jesus had been a royal teacher. Now, do you see the principle involved? I take it that the principle is this. In all life, there is a certain distance we must go. In every activity and energy of man, there is a certain limit we must reach to live. By the structure of our bodies, by the laws of nature, by the demands of business, by the call of duty, by the requirements of society and of our souls, we are compelled so far. But liberty and joy and real life begin when beyond that we go a little farther. In other words, there are certain demands made on us. No man escapes them, not even the humblest or poorest. Up to a certain point, we must obey. We have no choice. It is a universe of law. But... Christ says that beyond that, life commences, true life, with the breath of liberty upon it. And that is the sweet doctrine of the second mile. To put it otherwise, our text is like a parable of the mysterious change of duty into love. The first mile, that is the call of duty. The second mile, That is love's overplus, for love in action is duty glorified. Love is the fulfilling of the law. Here is a matron, for example, a good woman who has been set in charge of little motherless children, and she is nobly faithful to her task. The bitterest critic, and such women have many, could never accuse her of the least unfaithfulness. She goes to the last step of the first mile. But in place of the matron, just suppose the mother, who never thought of duty or of conscience, but whose heart is radiant with that amazing love of the true mother for her little children. And the mother, she has forgotten the first mile. She is away on the new mile every new morning. Love leads her to a thousand little services that the call of duty never could demand. She lives for her children. I suppose she would die for them. It is not conscience that carries her to that. Love is the secret. Love is always the secret of the second mile. It is the heart kindled with some affection. It is the touch of passion on the soul. It is the heightening of the cold power of will into the flame of affection and desire. It is that that carries the man beyond what is compelled into the liberty wherewith Christ has made him free. You see then at once that that second mile 
is really the type and emblem of Christianity. It is just the distinguishing difference between the Old Testament and the New. In the Old Testament, I hear the note of compulsion. Thou shalt do this and thou shalt not do that. In the Old Testament, my duty is laid down for me under the highest sanction of the divine. But in the New Testament life, it is not mapped like that. The heart is moved by the sight of the love of God to a new ardor of love for God and man. And it is that change of duty into love that has sent the world forward into the second mile. Are you always asking, how little can I do? You are still living on Old Testament levels. But have you begun to ask, how much can I do? then you are entering the New Testament mile. For love is not forced. Love does not calculate. Love does not narrow service to its lowest. Love gives, goes to the uttermost, forgets the milestones. And that is the spirit of Jesus and the gospel. I think, too, that the joy of Christianity is closely connected with this second mile. Is it not always in the overplus, in the little more than is absolutely necessary, that the joy of service really begins? If you are a teacher and only know your lesson, I am quite certain you will find teaching drudgery. But when you know more than the lesson book contains and have a grasp of things beyond the textbook, There is an ease and a kind of security about you that makes teaching begin to be a joy. So too, from the other side, the scholar's side, we are all compelled to go the mile in school days. There were certain lessons that we had to learn. We had to master them whether we would or no. And I never met any boys who really enjoyed that task work, except the objectionable boys in storybooks. The pity is so many go that mile and have never the heart to go a little farther. For beyond it is all the world of literature and all the fascinating tale of science. Such a feast for intellect, imagination, reason that we thank God that we were ever born. That is the second mile intellectually and no school board can compel anyone to tread it. Yet it is there that the real joy of having learned begins to flow like a tide within the soul. Now it is the same in Christianity. It is the same in the religious life. You must go a little beyond what is demanded if you would know the joy of Jesus Christ. Without a certain attention to the word of God, you know that your soul life cannot exist at all. Without a certain study of the scriptures and some attempt to serve and some poor prayer, without all that, you cannot be a Christian. It is the mile you are compelled to go. But it is when the soul begins to love the Bible and to find in it inestimable treasure. It is when the effort to serve becomes a passion and prayer grows like the breathing of the soul. It is then... It is in that overplus that the real joy of the serious life begins. Have you begun to experience that gladness, the gladness of the second mile? Press forward. Give thy whole heart to things. Do a little more than others could ever expect of you, but always quietly, secretly, never noisily. It is thus that the joy of the Lord becomes our strength. I want you also to observe that this spirit was just the spirit of Jesus Christ. If he summons you on to the second mile, do not forget he trod it first himself. Think, for example, of that wonderful scene when the multitude had followed Jesus for three days. And now it is evening, it will soon be dark, and the crowd is hungry and the place a desert. Send them away, said the disciples to Jesus. It is growing dark. Dismiss them, was their counsel. It seemed the kindest thing that Christ could do. Let them go home for food. 
But Christ was moved with compassion for the multitude. If he dismissed them, they might faint by the way. Then followed the miracle of the loaves and fishes, and they did all eat, and all were satisfied. Do you not feel the something more in that? Do you not feel that here was a deed of love that mere compulsion never could dictate? Compel them away, said Peter and James and John. But Jesus did infinitely better when he fed them. Or think of that poor villager born of four, the man who was sick of the palsy whom they brought to Christ. And because they could not get near him for the press, they broke up the roof and let him down that way. They wanted their friend cured. They were eager for a word, a touch of Jesus, that their palsied comrade might be himself again. And had Jesus granted them that and that only, it would have been the first mile, so to speak. But, son, thy sins be forgiven thee, said Jesus. It was more than they had ever thought or dreamed of. It was the unexpected and unsought addition of a heart that never could go far enough. They wanted a cure, and they would have it, though they broke the roof for it. They were going to compel Christ by their faith to go that mile. And Jesus went double the distance that they asked. He healed the man and pardoned his sins too. Why turn to separate incidents? The spirit of the second mile is the very spirit of the Incarnation. When I think of the open sores of this poor world, I feel there was a compulsion upon God. When I think of the miseries and sorrows of man, of the prayers that have been ascending night and day, of the dumb appeals that in the heart of the eternal must often be more powerful than prayer. When I think of all that I feel that God as a moral being was compelled to do something for his dark and sinning world. But when in the fullness of the time came Jesus Christ, God's only son, to live, to suffer, to die, the mile of moral compulsion is forgotten God in his love has gone with us, the twain. There was an old expression in our North Country prayers that one heard over and over again. What more couldst thou have done for us, O God, than thou hast done in giving us Jesus Christ? Yes, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son for you and for me. That, from the altitude of heaven, is the doctrine of the second mile. There is no must in it. There is no compulsion. There is no measurement of how much would save. Love gave its best. Love went to its uttermost in Jesus Christ. And you and I are followers of him. The Gentle Art of Making Happy by George H. Morrison Chapter 4 On the Illuminative Power of Immediate Action Deuteronomy 2, verse 31 Begin to possess that thou mayest inherit his land. The wanderings of the children of Israel were almost over now, but some of their greatest difficulties still remained. King Sihon, clearly a very gallant warrior, was quite determined to give battle to the invaders. And such was his fame, and such the might of his army, and so difficult was his highland territory, that Israel hesitated to accept the challenge. It was then that God encouraged his veteran leader. Begin to possess, that thou mayest inherit the land. There may be times for counsel, seasons to deliberate, but this is the hour, says the Almighty, to strike. 
and how Sihon was slain and his sons beside him, and how his cities were utterly destroyed, all that is written in the biblical record. But the point I wish to note in that immediate action is what I may call its illuminative power. There was a kind of foregleam of their whole inheritance in that single engagement with the Amorite. Begin to possess, that ye may inherit the land. Had Israel hesitated in that decisive moment, the coming difficulties would have grown insuperable. They had never forgotten the report that the spies brought back about the giants and the cities walled up to heaven, and they were face to face with these giants and cities now. You can hardly wonder if their hearts were sinking. But the Lord said to them, Begin to possess. Take the first step. Do the next duty at once. And they were taught so much by that one action and learned so much of the mighty power behind them that tomorrow, with its impending trial, grew clearer, brighter, because they had acted instantly today. It would have been quite fatal to deliberate. It would have been the height of folly to be cautious. There was only one road to their inheritance. It was the road of instant, vigorous work. There was not an Israelite that night after the battle, but felt the illuminative power of instant action. Now, on that subject, let us fix our minds, for it is vastly important in the right conduct of life. And the first thing I wish you to remember there's nothing new in it, it is quite commonplace, is what one might call the perplexity of life. Touch human life at any point you please, and immediately you are faced by insoluble difficulties. There is not a philosopher from Plato down to Kant, but is graveled by the first questions of a child. We are beset, surrounded, hedged by contradictions, There is nothing that would seem so impossible as living but for the strange circumstance that here we are alive. And the more you deliberate on what life means, and the more you try with the mere intelligence to grasp it, the more hopeless does the great riddle become. Now, no one will imagine that I am speaking slightingly of the great philosophers of whom the world has had, I owe too much to them, and we all owe too much to them, although perhaps we have never heard their names, not to hold them in the highest honor. But the point I am strong on, and that I wish to make clear, is that life and the universe express more than the thought of God. There is something greater than thought, and that is character. And life and the universe express God's character. If to live were to grapple with the thought of God, I think the intelligence would rule. But if to live is to apprehend God's character, then action above all things is illuminative. We may think a thousand thoughts about existence, but existence will be raveled and will be tangled still. But do the next duty at the call of God, and somehow we have made the whole world kin. We talk too much of the illuminative power of thought, and too little of the illuminative power of duty. It is notable, too, that that deep truth, so urgently needed if we are to live well, has found expression in some of our popular proverbs. Thus, for example... Delays are dangerous, or again, the man who hesitates is lost. Now, do not imagine that these proverbs merely mean that by delaying we lose our opportunity, or that when we hesitate the time is gone and the favorable hour will come no more. They mean that, but something beyond that too. 
They mean that when a man delays to act in the hope of balancing every argument clearly, when a woman hesitates to do her duty till she has perplexed her heart with infinite thought about it, the chances are in this conflicting world where the purest and wisest never see things clearly and where every choice is cradled in contradictions, the chances are that the power of strong action will disappear like a stream into the sand. That is, the man who hesitates is lost. I beseech you to remember that life is a great venture. We are here to walk by faith and not by sight. It is not the man who speculates and dreams and doubts. It is the man who acts, trusting in God, who finds the perplexities of life passing like a mist. And I have no doubt God meant it so. But to pass a little more into detail, I would note first how action illuminates our own character. I think we all feel the importance of self-knowledge. Even for our practical life, it is invaluable. There are many who would not break their hearts if they were called immoral, but it would be heartbreaking to think they were ridiculous. And there is nothing on earth so sure to make a man ridiculous as to be blandly ignorant of himself. The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. It's quite certain that there is no fool. Life teems with most humiliating pitfalls for the man who is quite a stranger to himself. Now, did you ever think of the illuminative power of action upon your own heart and character? It is not by dreaming, speculating, wondering. It is by playing the man. It is by action that you have begun to see what kind of man you are. When God drew near to you and said, Take up your cross, and when you did it at the call of heaven... Did you not find that you were very different from what you had once dreamed yourself to be? And when the bugle sounded and the call to battle, and like a true child of the church militant, you had the courage to accept the challenge, were there not hours when you wondered at yourself? For you never thought that this or that was in you. Self-introspection may illuminate much, but I tell you, that action illuminates still more. It is when we begin to possess the land, and not till then, that we come to see the kind of land it is. But action, immediate action, does more than that. Action illuminates the character of others. We learn to know men by what we see of them. We learn to know men by what we hear of them. But I think that beyond all that, beyond it and above it, we learn to know men by what we do. There is not a duty you ever bravely did. There is not a task you ever wrought out gallantly. There is not a cross you ever quietly carried. There is not a barrier you ever overleapt, but gave you new insight into some sister's life or help to explain the conduct of some brother. One deed done at the point of the bayonet, well done, and a thousand actions of other men are plain. One act of sacrifice, and you understand all sacrifice. One act of heroism, and all heroes are your kinsmen. And, on the other hand, one mean or nasty deed, one day of immorality or cowardice, and how the veil passes from a hundred hearts. It is by acting that we understand. Neglect of duty is always cursed by blindness. I would sooner take advice of stocks and stones than of a genius if he were a sluggard. If you want charity, if you want sympathy, If you want help in distress, if you want counsel, go to the man who has launched into the deep, who knows what strain and storm are, even shipwreck. It is a great deal better to run the chance of shipwreck than to stand trembling till the tide is out. It is by acting 
that I understand. I feel mankind to be my brothers then, and it is worth living only to feel that. This being so, it will surprise no one to be told that action illuminates the character of Christ. It is when we begin to possess Christ Jesus that we apprehend the glory of the Lord. I do not hesitate for one moment to say that the humblest woman who really trusts the Lord in that intense activity that is called faith knows more, sees more of the glory and character of the eternal Savior than the most learned theologian who is faithless. For remember, faith is action, immediate action. It is not a feeling, much less an emotion. It is the resolute bending of the whole personality, Christ words, and God words in one supreme endeavor. I cannot think of one action in the world that is so truly magnificent a deed as faith. Now, if deed illumines my brother's character, will not this deed illuminate Christ Jesus? Is there anything illogical, irrational in saying that you will never understand him until you act? And if the action is the greatest you can be called to, and faith is the supreme venture in the world accepting death, do not forget that the character to be known is, on the confession of the world, a peerless one. Do not forget that the good promised you is far above what you can ask or think. I just mean that the venture is worthwhile. It is therefore the highest wisdom to trust Christ. The illuminative power of that act is wonderful. You have been doubting, speculating, swithering, and God knows you have made little of it all. If Christianity had been an abstract thought, your thought might have understood it long ago. If Christianity were a body of doctrine, I might apprehend it all by my intelligence. But living Christianity is not that. Living Christianity is Christ. For me to live is Christ, said the apostle. It is character, manhood, personality. And it is not by mere thinking that we may grasp that character. It is by the great deed that we call faith. I call you to exercise it. Lord, increase our faith. It will scatter doubt, make rough places plain, and you can do that act this very hour. If I have a life with Christ to live, but ere I live it, must I wait till learning can clear answer give of this and that book's date? I have a life in Christ to live. I have a death in Christ to die. And must I wait till science give all doubts a full reply? Nay, Rather, while the sea of doubt is raging wildly roundabout, questioning of life and death and sin, let me but creep within thy fold, O Christ, and at thy feet take but the lowest seat, and hear thine awful voice repeat in gentlest accents, heavenly sweet, come unto me and rest, believe me, and be blessed. The Gentle Art of Making Happy by George H. Morrison Chapter 5 On the Evil Philosophy of the Clean Stall Proverbs 14, verse 4 Where no oxen are, the crib is clean, but much increase is by the strength of the ox. We have to remember that in these eastern countries it was oxen that were employed in farm work. Even to this day in the changeless east, one sees the oxen used so continually. It was oxen, you remember, that drove the new cart on which the Philistines laid the Ark of God. And the kind took the straight way to the way of Beth Shemesh and went along the highway lowing as they went. And it was against the ox goad that Saul had been vainly kicking. Saul, Saul, why per persecutest thou me? Immediately then, on reading a verse like this, the thought of an Eastern would be teeming with suggestion. Where no oxen are, the crib is clean, 
but by much increase is by the strength of the ox. Now we see at once the image in the writer's mind. It is often an incalculable help for rigorous thinking to get at the pictorial basis of a truth. Here is one stall, then unsoiled, immaculate. The stones of the floor of it are white and polished. There is no disordered hay inside the bars. It is beautiful, spotless. As we say, a man could dine in it. We would congratulate the farmer on its cleanliness. But why are the fields not plowed? And why has the threshing mill been standing idle? And why are the wagons not rolling to the market with the grain of the harvest that has been gathered in? Ah, where no oxen are, the crib is clean, but much increase is by the strength of the ox. You see then what Solomon would be at, in his own most happy and most pictorial way, and I thank God that for a people's Bible the writers were inspired to be imaginative. He is hinting, not darkly, at one great law of increase, and I should call it the law of the clean stall. It is a very pretty thing, a spotless manger. It is very pretty. Men will admire it readily. And there is so little doing in the fields, we can take all the morning to scrub and polish it. But is the farm work, God's work for the harvest, Is that in full swing outside the farmyard? Are the oxen threshing? And are the oxen plowing? And is the soil being tilled as the Creator meant it? Then probably the stall will not be clean. A little disorder in it soiled here and there, not spotless. The poor beast slept in it last night. But the work is done. Thank God that is the point. Somehow, with all the soiling and stain of it, the work is done, and there shall be a harvest. And a rich harvest, when the autumn comes, is better a thousand times than a clean stall. We have to sacrifice a little. That is the point. Make up your minds. There is no gain without some loss. Life is so exquisitely compensated, we cannot have everything. Be sure of that. The true philosophy is to grasp the very highest and let the rest go if need be. He is a fool who fears for his clean stall when God is giving him a hope of harvest. For where no oxen are, the crib is clean, but much increases by the strength of the ox. Now I want to take that law of increase and run it out into different spheres. And first we must think of scenery. We must Dwell a moment on the beauty of the world. When we are young, it is always, I expect. But when we begin to get older, I remember. Well, you remember what? I shall say the village where you spent your childhood. What a quiet, sweet corner of God's beautiful world. The church and the trees and the stream, it seems like yesterday. But you were back there lately, and what a change. You would hardly know it for the same place again. Great rows of ugly tenements on the street and a mill beside the stream and the water polluted. Gas in the lamps, too, and a bank or two. How changed since you were a little fellow there. Then it was a quiet, clean village, and now it is a noisy mining center. Ah, yes. Where no oxen are the crib is clean, but much increase is by the strength of the ox. I never see the furnaces of Larkinshire or the gloomy tract of the black country in England, but I keep whispering that text in my heart. I love the country. I don't think anyone could love it more genuinely than I do. But when I think of what these furnaces speak of, with all their attendant disorder and uncleanness, I say it is better so, ten thousand times, than a clean crib. For they speak of the wrestle of mankind with nature and how he has forced her buried secrets from her, how he has compelled her to reveal her riches and has used them for the civilization of the world. And thou hast put all things under his feet, says David. Thou hast created him to have control. And if every shaft that is sunk into the earth And every furnace, like a pillar of fire by night, speaks of the mastery of mind over dead matter. I say, let the beauty go 
We can afford to lose it. There is something better than the clean crib after all. Where no oxen are, the crib is clean, but much increase is by the strength of the ox. Again, in sweeter and more gentle ways, we can apply the same thoughts to our homes. It has been done before with an exquisite tenderness by one of the choicest of our Scottish preachers. You know how perfectly tidy many a home is when there are no little children on the floor. There is a place for everything and everything in its place. There is not a shadow of disorder anywhere. But when the children come, there is still a place for everything, but everything is seldom in its place. There dwells a perfect genius for disorder in the hearts of these little citizens of heaven. Scattering, tearings, drawers ransacked and rearranged. There is no question there are oxen in the stall. But, O oh, thou father and mother in a worldly city, think of the increase in your own poor soul, increase of tenderness amid all that childish sunshine, increase of patience from their thousand questions, increase of sacrifice as the calls and expenses come, increase of love and prayer and pleadings with God. Was it not worth it, with all the care of it, to have these little heavenward messengers by the hearth? Ah, yes. Where no oxen are, the stall is clean, but much increase is by the strength of the ox. Or, looking abroad, beyond the sphere of the home, I find that in every revival of religion, in every great reformation in a land, this law of increase is at work. In dull, dead times, there is a spiritual decency that is quite the counterpart of this clean crib. Religion is a most respectable performance. Men would not offend the proprieties of the worlds. If blood and fire and sin and hell are coarse words, let us give them a decent burial by all means. And men will write books, and this will be the title of them, The Apostles of Jesus, No Enthusiasts. The crib is eminently clean. There is no doubt of it. The crib is clean. The pity is, tis Christless. Then comes like an ox team God's mighty spirit, and the crib is not spotless any more, I warrant you. There is disorder, there is excitement, there is excess, and there are things said, and there are things done in the heat of it, that the wise will deplore, and the shallow will sneer at, and the old strong gospel words come back, and the proprieties are shocked, I do not doubt. But the work is done, thank God, that is the point. The superstitions and shams are swept away, and men stand forth to feel and know that Christ is living. And oh, it is better to have Christ among us than the cleanest crib that was ever swept and garnished. It is the old story. It is the picture of Solomon. It is this little parable writ large in Reformations. Where no stall oxen are, the stall is clean, but much increase is by the strength of the ox. And in your own spiritual history, that law of increase holds. There was a time for you, perhaps, when the crib was clean. You did not trouble much about religion. You went on as thousands of others do, tolerably happy, very well content. You were not the least anxious about your soul, though you had no objection to religion. Somehow the gospel seemed very far away. Christ and the cross were outside you altogether. You were respectable. Your life was orderly so far as man could judge. The stall was clean. And then, what happened? I draw a bow at a venture. Christ became real to you. You felt that God was living. A passion for nobler things kindled and took you. Grander ideals flushed up out of the dark. And for the first time, the bondage of sin arrested you. And for the first time, you cried, unclean, unclean. And longings awoke you had never felt before. Cravings for God that had a sting in them. A sense of unrest. A feeling of disorder with the old content gone like a sweet dream. And still come hours, hours of despondency, when you are tempted to wish it back again. Oh, let me explain you to yourself. The sense of the infinite has touched you. 
Childhood has gone. You have wakened to kinship with God. There is pain in it, but there is love and heaven in it. The note of unrest, and I know not what of struggle, has deepened life's music that was once so shallow. Oh, sir, forget the things that are behind. It is better thus with all the unrest of it. It is better thus with all the sense of failure. It is better to struggle Christwards every morning than to be content like a child in a clean stall. There is expansion in it. In spa- expansion through antagonism, there is increase in it, a coming harvest yonder. Yes, where no oxen are, the crib is clean, but much increase is by the strength of the ox.